There were people who were fighting every system, such as religion, politics, and health. They are not just the untaught individuals such as Lysander Spooner or Charles Lane. When people truly research freedom not limited to the founding fathers of countries or the countless philosophers through the decades, one is bound to run into individuals who did a lot of great things, even if the internet does not have more than one article about them or one book about them. The abolitionist Jeremiah Hacker of the 19th century had an endless pursuit of truth in his own corner of the world in Maine, America. He wrote and edited a weekly newspaper for over 20 years, The Pleasure Boat and the Chariot of Wisdom. The motto for his paper was Truth Against Error, Victory or Death, and Bound to No Party, to No Sect Confined, The World Our Church, Our Brethren, All Mankind. From prison reform to advocating the rights of women to fighting poverty to advocating against the Civil War, he did it all. We can expect that a devotion to freedom away from slavery will spark many other desires for virtue. He would purposefully greet those who needed the message of liberty, from the jails to people in court cases, and if they thought his work was full of lies, he would ask them to critique his writings so that he may improve. A man by the name of R.C. White would help him with his newspaper, with no compensation or reward, only to share what they called the truth. He even held other abolitionists accountable, saying that although they were against slavery, they were buying products made with slave labor. Similarly, he would criticize peace activists for paying taxes to a government engaged in warfare. Jeremiah started his journey as an educative farmer, also teaching penmanship. Then getting involved with the Quakers, coming to realize that they are not the organization they used to be. He would go on to talk about how corrupt and institutionalized they were becoming, along with the rest of society. As a practicing missionary and preacher free of charge, he thought the truth should be shared freely. He would even criticize his own religions more and more, referring to the fact people should look more within themselves for the answers rather than man's creations. He was able to tear down people's organized religions, his journals full of success stories. He states, quote, we had much rather be all alone in the right than with the whole world in the wrong. And quote, that we are right in denouncing all wars as unnecessary and wicked, we daily have the witness of peace and a clear conscience. He often promoted self-reliance in promoting a society where people provide for one another, lessening any need for government at all. He said the only government they would need would be a government of truth in their own minds. True reform to Jeremiah meant people quietly going about the business of improving others' lives. Among other abolitionist traditions, he became more of a spiritualist in connecting with the dead and a promoter of temperance, restraining from alcohol usage. He would criticize those promoting temperance while using the law to their aid, saying that their moral suasion should not be using the strong arm of the law. He states, quote, Men will not permit others to say what they shall or shall not eat or drink. They are willing to be reasoned with in these matters, but are not willing to be forced. What folly then for any men or set of men to enact penal laws by which to govern the appetites of others? Such a course ever has and ever will increase the evil it aims to cure. In the pleasure boat, he wrote, quote, I wish to see a free meeting, free from politics and priestcraft, and every ism, held early in the morning on the first day of the week before a single glass of spirit is drawn open for everyone regardless of any societal status. Therefore, as a rebel at heart, he knew that it also meant not siding with government to make your ideals become true, because it would make matters worse, also having a clear conscience. He teaches us that if you really are a rebel, you must share and educate the truth to everyone, including those who don't want to hear it, then not to forget to practice it yourself. 
Hacker would criticize Northerners for slavery just as much as the South in relation to government and political slavery. For even his views on women as equals, he did not care for voting as a whole. He stated, quote, as for voting, I do not believe in it for either sex. He commonly stated that government was making people robbed of the earth, being a land reform advocate of great success so that people without land may produce and live. He clarifies his seemingly radical yet moral position for not supporting government. Quote, what do I care which party a man belongs to? If people will dabble in filth, they will find no lack of it in either party. Quote, the boat owns no distinction of sect nor party and recognizes no national bounds but claims the whole universe as its nation and would rejoice to see every party division, political and religious, swept from the earth. Quote, when I look upon the two great political parties, I see only a couple of wolves, nearly alike in size and ferocity, fighting over the fat carcass of a foolish sheep that has run headlong into their den. Sometimes one is rather fatter, sometimes the other, and when I witness their quarrels, I rejoice in the distant prospect of that day when both parties will be destroyed by the spread of the gospel of peace and humanity. Quote, there are two kingdoms or principles which are directly opposite to each other, in spirit and in practice. One is the kingdom or principle of love, and it rules its subjects by convincement and persuasion. It teaches us what is evil and what is good, and saves the erring. The other is the kingdom of force, and labors to overcome evil by evil, and destroys, crushes, and ruins. No man can belong to both these kingdoms at the same time. If he is a peace man, he cannot willingly move a finger to aid the government of force. He can neither vote nor hold office under such a government. To reiterate, the alternative to government, Jeremiah states, is the kingdom or principle of love that rules by persuasion. We know evidently this is people embracing who they are meant to be. Nobody has the right to impose their will by violence onto another. This concept is heavily detailed in works like The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose. Most people in politics today, mostly, if not all of them, have no clue that this is the case. They wouldn't be in politics if they knew about it. Jeremiah goes on to detail our own political slavery. Quote, this nation, at the present time, appears to be a nation of bondholders and bond slaves, with a government instituted to protect the one and subjugate the other, to incessant toil for their support in idleness and vice. For the purpose of subjugating the toilers and making them slaves, the priests and politicians have instituted a large standing army who are riding down with whip and spur all opposition to their authority, and flashing their flaming swords and bayonets in our faces to intimidate us into submission. Having direct experience with the prison systems, talking with many prisoners, he states, quote, Brotherly counsel and assistance are better than prisons. Quote, Woe to the nation whose laws will throw such a child into prison and try him in court to disgrace, harden, and ruin him when by a little kindness he might be reclaimed. He then went on to prove his claim where his readers would go on to create many different projects inspired by it. The governor of the town would go on to take credit, and Jeremiah criticized it, since the idea originated with his work. One of his old reform schools lasted more than a hundred years after his death. All in all, in Jeremiah's perspective, there was no reason for man-made law or human government, the same view shared by the other abolitionists in his day. We can learn and become inspired by his rebellious spirit in a world like today with many institutions that may not act out of any principle of morality and many order followers willing to suppress their own conscience in order to do their bidding. A huge thanks to historian and journalist Rebecca M. Pritchard for being one of the few people willing to document Jeremiah Hacker and bring his works back to life. She even concludes that Jeremiah's view was simple. Quote, if enough people ignored the government and lived their lives as though it did not exist, the government would have no choice but to go away. 
To finalize, he states, quote, My object has not been to reform the leaders. They are at the present too intent on unrighteous gain, too earnest after the loaves and the fishes to listen. They would only regard my testimony as the rattle of a pleasure boat. My work is with the people. As he never voted nor paid taxes, we must come to do the same if we want a truly moral or voluntary free world. Since his time, this work has grown tremendously, to abolitionist Emma Goldman, to now our time with myself, voluntarists, and you.